good morning and good afternoon to in-house counsel from all across North America. Welcome to In-House Connect. My name is Shai Mahani. I am the CEO and co-founder of In-House Connect. I'm thrilled to have you here with us today. Thank you for spending your breakfast time or your lunch time with us. And special thanks to our wonderful sponsor, Osborne Clark, our fantastic presenters today. Felix Hilgert and Katie Vickery for putting together this much needed presentation on European compliance, the new deal for consumers, AKA the next GDPR. For those of you who are here for the first time, let me give you a quick bit of background on in-house connect. In-House Connect started 11 years ago as a New York City-based meetup group for in-house counsel. Every month, we would organize free CLE classes hosted by different law firms, which were then followed by cocktail networking receptions. And every six months, we would organize fun and festive networking mixers. Over the years, we've helped thousands of in-house counsel connect with peers and outside counsel alike. Uh, the group was humming along, and then, of course, COVID hit. We couldn't meet in person, so we went online, which has been a great transition. We've been able to attract a much larger audience of in-house counsel truly from coast to coast, and we've been able to facilitate way more networking, relationship building, and feature high caliber speakers like the two we have today, who I'm going to introduce in just a few moments. And before I get to that, this is our 19th event of the year. And I'm wondering, is this your first in-house connect event? Let me know by taking this poll. Funny enough, we always have 37% uh, new attendees. So let's see if, if those percentages bear out. I guess we have 41% of attendees to our, our program today so welcome and i hope you i hope you enjoy it so today's event european compliance update when in house council need to know about the new deal for consumers aka the next gdpr today's presenters are katie vikery and felix hilger katie is a regulatory specialist that helps businesses manage their risk and defense companies who are subject to regulatory investigations and enforcement katie has spent over 20 years helping clients understand the regulatory compliance framework particularly in the fields of product safety ea HS, environment, health and safety, food and consumer law, and trading law. She manages multi-jurisdictional projects and helps businesses to launch in new markets with new products. Katie also defends companies who are being investigated and prosecuted by regulators. Our next speaker is Felix. Felix is a technology and video games lawyer with a focus on helping North American companies expand and succeed abroad. His practice centers on IP and IT agreements, e-commerce, as well as specific issues of the interactive entertainment industry. Felix advises innovative software and technology companies, as well as online retailers and digital platforms on license development and software as a service contracts, AR, VR, as well as standard terms for B2B and B2C transactions. He also manages international expansion projects and complex contract negotiations, advises on e-commerce and consumer protection, and is also regularly involved in technology-driven transactions. We are so fortunate to have Felix and Katie on with us today to provide us with an EU compliance update. And with that, I'll turn things over to Felix to get us started. Thanks, Shai. It's a pleasure to be here and to be speaking to all of you. So I will kick it off with a bit of an overview of the New Deal and what, what that is and what we'll be talking about. And I'll uh, be focusing on two aspects of that in Europe, the so-called Omnibus Directive and the Digital Content Directive. Then uh, turn it over to Katie, who is going to talk about various pieces of regulation that are coming out or currently being implemented in the realm of product compliance, and that's going to be um, all, all sorts of all sorts of things, environmental and and other. And then we're going to go uh, take a look at Germany uh, because Germany is ahead of the pack for the rest of Europe, implementing some more torture instruments for companies um, selling, especially subscriptions uh, to German consumers. There are some some things to be aware of, and then um, we'll have a, a summary and a kind of an action plan and some best practices on how you deal with that when you're sitting here in, in the US and you're trying to manage and oversee um, compliance of your European operation. So um, I should maybe um, uh, specify one tiny disclaimer. I am entirely US unqualified, as are all of my colleagues. So we do not provide any um, US legal advice. We are here um, to help American companies expand overseas. So we're, we're your access to overseas legal advice in, in Europe and Asia. And I uh, have to talk more about that when we get to, to the networking. So feel, feel free to reach out. Um, so what is this new deal? And uh, when we announce this uh, presentation, um, sometimes we get that question like, why are you calling it the new deal? Isn't that confusing? People are gonna think you're talking about FDR. 
Um, it's called that because FDR, because the EU um, likes that moniker, the New Deal, and is slapping it on everything these days. So there's a new Green Deal, and there's this package of legislation called the New Deal for Consumers. They officially call it that, um, which consists of a number of legislative measures uh, that are intended to uh, strengthen consumer rights and, and enhance the enforcement of consumer rights across the European Union. Um, so there's kind of a narrow definition of it that only includes the Omnibus Directive and Representative Actions Directive, but really when we talk about the New Deal for Consumers, it's those four directives um, that I have on the slide here, um, which uh, the first one is Digital Content Directive and Sale of Goods Directive. What they do is create a unified contract law for uh, contracts involving digital content and services and obviously the sale of goods. Um, intended to make the contract law just more modern and, and adapted to things that happen when you sell things online and when you sell digital content as opposed to just just uh, physical merchandise. And then the omnibus directive um, is an, a package of updates to different other directives that is kind of bringing consumer law to a, a modern uh, to a modern level. And then finally, our Christmas present this year is the Representative Actions Directive, which creates something kind of sort of like a class action in Europe. We don't have that there yet. Um, and this one is designed to avoid some of the things that people hate about class actions in the US. Um, so the most important point of that is that only registered nonprofits are going to be able to be plaintiffs here. Um, but it is intended to um, be a tool to help recover kind of tiny little pinprick damages where each consumer is screwed out of a dollar and nobody would ever go litigate for that, but a, a nonprofit can go and then come after that company and, and somehow figure out how to distribute what they, what they earn. How exactly that will be implemented, so all of these are directives, so they need to be implemented by national legislation in the member states, and the representative actions directive, how exactly it will be implemented, we don't really know yet. So um, I'll be happy to come back next year and, and talk about that, but uh, that needs to be implemented by the 27th of December this year. So uh, yeah, so right around Christmas. So what does this new deal for consumers do? It affects three phases of all consumer contracting, kind of the pre-contractual phase, the information and disclosures you have to provide, the actual mechanism of how you enter into a contract, and then the rights and obligations that come from that contract. So the omnibus directive um, is kind of in that pre-contractual and concluding the contract phase and then digital content and sale of goods directives govern the actual content of that agreement that you have. Um, the omnibus directive talks about unfair business practices and withdrawal rights and, and, and those things. Um, digital content and sale of goods directive among other things, includes a mandatory warranty, termination provisions, and some other uh, bits and pieces that we will get into. So it covers the entire journey here. The, the uh, digital content and sale of goods directives have already been implemented. They've been enforced since uh, the beginning of the year. And for the omnibus directive, um, the implementation deadline is, is very soon in a month. At the end of May, 2022, all of that needs to be implemented in the member states. Um, I'm not going to get into a lot of detail on this slide. This is mostly to scare you. Um, what we did here is um, we broke down a typical consumer purchase journey in, a, in an e-commerce setting uh, into the individual steps and requirements that are somehow associated with it. Um, and everything that's a blue box here, a light blue box, is a step of the process where this new deal for consumers will affect how it's designed and what kind of information you have to provide so on. So you can see that uh, it's not a matter of, you know, changing out a paragraph in the terms and conditions. There's a lot more to it, which is why if um, you have an operation in Europe and you haven't thought about this, now is high time to think about it. So the omnibus directive, what is at stake here? What are we doing here? Um, what the EU Commission has said about this directive and this, this legislative package is what we want to do is an overhaul of consumer law to give it more teeth and bring it up to date. So it is supposed to hurt to not, to not comply with this. Um, it updates four directives, the unfair contract terms directive, the price indication directive, 
uh, Unfair Commercial Practices Directive and the Consumer Rights Directive itself. So you can already guess from the from the titles what kinds of things are going to be affected. So um, there's going to be regulation on um, what you are allowed to put in terms and conditions. There are going to be rules about how you communicate your pricing. Um, unfair Commercial Practices Directive is a general, I mean, the, the general kind of the purpose of that is to say you cannot mislead consumers, whether that's by lying to them or by omitting something or, or putting pressure on them. Um, and that will get updated with, with, a few, uh, with a few specifics. And then the Consumer Rights Directive is, if you're already dealing in Europe, you have heard of this, is where the withdrawal rights that so consumer buys anything online, they generally have 14 days to change their mind and give it back for a full refund, um, including uh, digital services and digital content. Uh, there are some exceptions there. So you can get out of having to refund someone for the movie they just paid to watch and then watch them and said, oh, now I don't want it anymore. Um, but you have to implement it correctly. And this uh, consumer rights directive is also getting an update um, because certain things are changing that it needs to, it needs to reflect. So why am I why do I keep saying and why do we keep saying that this is the new GDPR? Well, just like the GDPR, much of what this does is not new. It's tiny updates, it's details, but non-compliance is getting a lot more expensive. That was exactly the same thing with GDPR. And the European Union has understood that when they wave a 4% fine in your face, then Americans start paying attention. So, um, the, the kind of most important and most scary bit of the omnibus directive is that now not complying with these requirements of having fair consumer terms and having non-misleading price statements and having all the mandatory disclosures. Um, if you don't do it, there have to be what the directive calls effective, proportionate and dissuasive sanctions um, for widespread infringements or something is called widespread infringements with a pan-European dimension. And what that essentially means is if it affects three or more member states. But if you're gonna sell your product in the EU, it's very hard to not sell it in three or more member states because you're not gonna just go and say, this is gonna be only available in Belgium, Italy, and Malta. Um, you're usually gonna go after a, a handful of markets and then you're, you're, you're easily gonna be in that. Those sanctions, so that they are effective, proportionate, and dissuasive, um, need to take into account things like the, I mean, that is not super helpful, but nature, gravity, extent, and duration of the infringement, um, whether it's repeated, and whether you made a lot of money doing it. So um, those sample criteria, we expect that um, authorities and regulators are going to put some thought into some guidance and a framework how to apply that and, and we'll provide some examples and, and guidelines how it's going to happen. That's the same thing that happened with GDPR where, where um, large um, thick documents were produced to explain how our fines assist and calculated. But for three of those directives, not the price ind indication directive, but the other three, um, if you breach them, um, there has to be the states have to enact maximum or have to enact penalties where the maximum may not be lower than 4% of the company's annual revenue. Now, quick sidebar, all of this does not apply in the UK automatically because of course they're no longer part of the European Union, but the UK has already started consultations on implementing something that's gonna be very similar and modeled on this, except that they're not going for 4%, they're going for 10%. So non-compliance in the UK is also going to be um, very expensive. They're a little bit behind on this. So this is not going to, in the UK, it's not going to kick in uh, just yet. But in, in, within Europe, uh, we have this starting in May. So as the, in the words of the EU Commission, consumer authorities will get teeth to punish the cheaters. It cannot be cheap to cheat. Um, that's, the whole, that's the whole thing. So... What is new in terms of content that we didn't have before in this new deal? Um, there is a new concept of paying with data. So a lot of the 
consumer protection provisions that we have in European consumer protection law right now apply to contracts, B2C contracts where the consumer pays for something. They don't so far, or they, they didn't used to apply to contracts where the consumer ostensibly got something for free. Um, they could use a social network for free or an online game for free. Um, because in the background, somebody was looking at all the data and how they were interacting and then doing something with that information they were collecting. But there was no withdrawal right, there were no information obligations, there were no mandatory warranties for all of the stuff that consumers got for free. Now we have this concept of paying with data that is going to mean that a lot of contracts that we thought were free are no longer free, uh, which means that all of these information obligations and right of withdrawal and all that stuff kicks in. Now, you might say, well, I don't care if someone withdraws necessarily, they're not paying me anyways, and they gave me the data already, but you do have to stop doing anything with that data if they withdraw. So, and, and also, if you don't comply with the information obligations, that could put you in breach, and then um, we, we have those fines to kick in. Uh, there's another, a new category of contract or a new category of product, which is called a digital service. So it used to be, I alluded to this withdrawal right before, um, that if you are selling a movie that someone can download or a, a, um, a streaming service, I can sign up for the streaming service. Um, I can pay my whatever, however much it is up front, and then I get access to the streaming service, and then I stream the content. And it, and it used to be that you were able to then disclaim that withdrawal, right? And say, well, as soon as you start looking at stuff on my streaming service, you can't then withdraw from the contract and get a refund of what you paid. Um, that will change because there is now a distinction between kind of one-off digital content and ongoing digital services. When in doubt, it's going to be a service and not a one-off piece of content. So any kind of streaming um, services will be caught by that. And then you cannot get out of the withdrawal right anymore. Um, and then there are some new transparency and information obligations that are primarily important for marketplaces, but also for just regular online sale of stuff. Um, so, uh, some, some of these uh, include algorithm transparency. So you do have to disclose not kind of the nitty gritty details, the secret sauce of how your recommendation algorithm works, but you do have to, if you have a platform that ranks different, different uh, sellers offerings, you do have to provide some information about how you do that. Uh, why is this offering on top? Why is this one at the bottom? Um, how are they weighed? Who can influence that? Uh, do, do you rank someone higher because they pay you more or because they're a premium seller on your platform? So you do have to disclose some of that. Uh, there's another thing, this is also a trend in Europe now that there, we, we, we engage in this kind of nudging behavior where um, you have to disclose what you do to verify the authenticity of user reviews that are published on your platform, whether it's a platform or whether it's your own online store where people review a product. So. Obviously, what it doesn't say is you have to actually make sure that there are no fake reviews on your platform. Um, but it does say you have to explain what you do to avoid that. So if you can truthfully say, we don't do anything, that's not gonna look good. So the idea is people are gonna wanna do effective, reasonable things, whatever that may mean, so that they can then truthfully talk about what they do to avoid fake reviews on their platform. If you're a platform, you would have to do um, due diligence on your business customers. So you have to know who those sellers are that are selling stuff on the platform and whether they are just consumers, somebody who's basically doing a virtual garage sale on eBay or um, traders who are then themselves caught by consumer protection requirements. You have to disclose more information about product features than before. So um, obviously, it, it has always been the rule that you have to describe your product truthfully um, and then certain things were always considered misleading behavior if you created the impression that your product can do a certain thing but in fact it can't or if you outright lie about something that was always illegal but now there there is a, a list of additional things that need to be disclosed like um, interoperability and functionality of digital contents and goods with digital elements goods with digital elements are essentially 
all kinds of smart products that require some kind of digital, um, some software or cloud service so that they function to the full of their, uh, of their um, capacity. So you have to now say with what kinds of operating systems your product is compatible or whether it needs a companion app and all of that needs to be clearly marked in, in any product offering. Um, pricing details, this is a complicated one um, because there are so many differences between how the various member states actually implement um, the price indication directive. There is, that one leaves a lot of, uh, of maneuvering room for the member states. So you have, if you want to advertise with a price where you cross off something and you say was 10 is now five, um, you can only do that if you actually did charge 10 for a certain amount of time. Um, you have to uh, you have to inform people whether there is a personalized price some, somewhere and how you get to that personalized price. Um, and also, if there's no price in money, does that actually mean it's free or is there some kind of payment by data associated with that product? And then some contact information. So lots of things that need to be disclosed. Next on, the other one I did want to focus on here is the digital content directive that creates this new contract law for digital content and services. Um, because that contains a lot of things that may also feel a little bit unusual to, um, to Americans and to the way that usually terms and conditions for digital products and services are, are drafted in, in the US. Basically, what they always say is, here's the product. If you don't like it, maybe you can get a refund, but you have 90 days for that. And um, otherwise, you have no rights. Obviously, you're still going to make a consumer whole if there's really a problem with the product, but basically the terms always read like there's no, there are no rights. That does not work in Europe, has never worked in Europe, but uh, now it's getting even more strict um, because there are now very detailed conformity rules that create an implied and mandatory fitness for purpose uh, warranty. I'll get into some more detail in, in a second. And then there is a set of mandatory remedies that all consumers have. And there are also some strict requirements for the modification of the digital content or services. So this is another one, obviously, that all cloud service terms and all kind of online services terms will say, we reserve the right to change the terms and by continuing to use our product, you agree to that. Doesn't fly in Europe, never flew, now even less, but now it doesn't fly and there's a 4% fine attached to it. Um, there is now, however, um, a possibility to have a clause in your in your terms that allows you to change the product a little bit, but only if there is a legitimate reason for that. What is a legitimate reason? The legislator thinks that is something like um, an update that patches some kind of uh, security concern, um, some kind of bug in the software. And if that requires a change in the features, that's probably reasonable. What they certainly don't mean by that is to just randomly take features out or make them subject to an additional, you only get this if you pay for the premium or, or something like that. Um, and we're gonna have to wait for some case law to know kind of where that, where that line is, what you can change unilaterally and where you would need to get consent from consumers. And all of this, again, applies not just for contracts where someone pays you money, but also applies to contracts where someone allows you to use their data. So what is that paying with data? What does that actually mean? Um, the, it, is, it is very unclear how personal data is going to be treated as consideration because it's something that you cannot easily refund or give back or even put a price tag on it. Um, but the core element here is if you consent or commit to consent to a, uh, to a trader that when you use their product, their digital content, digital service, they can take personal data, collect it and do something with it in a way that's not required for the provision of the service or the, the administration of the contract, then that's considered like paying and it's a it is then a paid consumer contract um, there are some open issues around that like if i provide data to someone is that already an offer to enter into the contract each member state has a different interpretation of that so 
it, it's worth looking at that kind of on a, at least in the key markets on a state by state basis. Um, how do I provide pre-contractual information if I don't yet know that someone's gonna give me data? They've just put it into some, some data field. Um, there's gonna be some, some figuring out that, uh, that has to happen. Um, especially, um, I know that a lot of, uh, in a lot of American services, you'll have some terms that say, by visiting the website, you agree to these terms. Again, not something that works in, in, in Germany or in broader in Europe. So what happens if by someone coming on the website, they already, you already collect some data from them, are you already in a contract with them? So this is one to, to be watched where a lot of contours are still gonna have to be determined by, by case law. And then I've, I've talked about the digital content and services distinction. So digital content, the definition is data created and delivered in a digital form, um, which is obviously super, super broad. And you would think everything is that, but then you have digital services um, that uh, are kind of more specific and anything that could be a service is gonna be a service when in doubt. So now we are in a paid contract for digital content and digital services and we have these mandatory warranty rights. What does that actually mean? So there are some subjective conformity requirements. That means that your digital content and services must basically do what you promised they would do. So it must meet all the contractual requirements, everything that's in the contract about their quantity, quality, functionality, compatibility, interoperability. And remember, all of those are mandatory pieces of information that you have to provide. So you can't, you can't really go and say, well, um, my product is gonna be compatible with lots of things, but I prefer not to say what it's compatible with because then if I overpromise, I'm on the hook. If I don't say that it's compatible with something, then it might still be, uh, but if it then happens to not be, not my problem. That doesn't work because you do have to truthfully inform people that this is compatible with whatever operating system or whatever device. It must be fit for the agreed contractual purpose. So if your contract has any kind of language in it that, or, or even your advertising materials that say, um, this product is, does this, it's good for that, then it actually has to be fit for that purpose. So far, so good. Um, you have to supply accessories and so on that, that are needed to use it. And um, it must be updated as specified in the contract. It also must be updated as not specified in the contract, meaning even when you sell a one-off piece of digital content, you do have an obligation to provide security updates for that piece of content for as long as the life of that content is, especially for smart products, that's going to be um, very interesting to see how long that time period is, is going to be. Um, because a smart product, like a smart home product that you build into a home that could be good for 10 years, there are voices in legal literature that are saying, well, that means that after you sell it for 10 years, you have to provide not functional update, updates and, and making it better, but you at least have to provide the security updates if a bug is discovered to, to fix that. And then, in addition to what you agreed in the contract, there is an objective fitness for purpose. Um, so objectively, um, your uh, product must be fit for the purpose for which that type of product is generally used. So if you are selling a word processor, even if you say nothing about a spell checker, you could argue that, well, all word processors have spell checkers. So um, it, if it doesn't have one, then it might not be compliant. Um, if you have supplied a trial version of anything, then your full version needs to include everything that was in the trial version. You are theoretically able to disclaim some of those objective conformity requirements, but only by entering into a separate agreement with the consumer, which cannot be in the same set of terms and conditions that they accept when they first buy the thing or download the thing. Um, so in reality, that is not ever gonna happen because you're not gonna go and pick up the phone and say, hey, consumer, um, I'd also like to agree with you that um, my uh, word processor is only for people who know how to spell, so it doesn't include a spell checker. That's not gonna happen. So that's a theoretical possibility in the law, but it, we don't expect it to ever have practical importance. All right. And so I have been 
uh, I've been talking about the, the duration of the of the update obligation. I saw someone uh, just uh, said in the chat, so in video games, they have to support them forever. Well, yes and no. Um, if your contract is for participation in an online game over a certain period of time, you can obviously get out of that contract at some point. You can terminate it um, and sunset the game and end it, and then you don't have to do anything with it anymore. If you have a, doesn't really exist all that much anymore, but if you have one game that you can download, it doesn't have an online mode or anything, you just pay for it once, you download it, and you play it, you play it, um, then yes, updates need to be coming for as long as one could reasonably expect that game to be operational. It should be at least for the warranty period, which is two years. It might be longer than that. Um, again, I don't have the crystal ball that will tell me for each product, what are courts gonna say? How long can a consumer reasonably expect there to be product updates? Um, but, so again, in the whole in the whole legislative process, the arguments that were exchanged and kind of the scientific writing about all of this was all about it depends on what it is and whether it's a high value product or a low value product. If I paid five euros for something, maybe I don't expect it to last forever. If I paid five hundred euros for some device, some smart device, then I will expect it to last a lot longer. What are those warranty claims then that I have been talking about that are mandatory? Consumers have uh, initially, the right to demand supplementary performance, um, that's a right for the consumer, but it's also kind of a right for the provider because it means that all of the other torture instruments there on the slide um, can only be used if your supplementary performance fails. So if my digital, my piece of digital content stops working because some bug pops up that has always obviously been in the code, but it now manifests itself, it stops working. Um, I can go to, funny enough, the person I bought it from, it doesn't necessarily have to be the manufacturer. So if you're someone selling something to consumers that you don't manufacture yourself, you better have some language in your contract with the actual manufacturer saying that if the software stops working, you got to create the update because I can't even, I don't have the rights, I don't have the, the source code, I don't have the know-how, I just sell stuff, right? That's a little bit weird, but it means you, you do get a chance to provide a patch or a new version of the product that doesn't have that defect, and then you're done. That's the warranty claim. If you cannot provide supplementary performance within a reasonable deadline, and what's reasonable is also a little bit flexible, it could be a couple of weeks maybe, then the consumer has a choice. They can either claim a reduction of the price, so they can say, I will keep this because part of it still works uh, and I still want to use it, but it's obviously only worth half of what I paid because half of the things it was supposed to do, it doesn't do or no longer does, um, then they can get that partial refund. Or they can just say, it doesn't work 100% what was promised and what was objectively, what it objectively needed to do. Here it is back, I want a refund. Um, and then in some cases, there are additional damages, um, not super easy um, in, in the kind of like digital content and digital services space. But if your, if your um, digital content or service is so faulty that it breaks something else. I don't know, it deletes a user's information on their hard drive, um, then there might even be a damage claim on top of that. Obviously, supplementary performance doesn't shield you there because if the hard drive's erased, it's erased. There's nothing else you can do. You have to pay for, for that. With that, I hope that Katie is here and can take over on product compliance. Katie's here. I am indeed. <laughs> Thank you very much. And uh, sorry, everybody, that I wasn't with you right at, at the start. Uh, for those of you who've been to the uh, UK, you'll know that the M25, which is the big uh, motorway that goes around London, is uh, known as a car park. And that's what, um, unfortunately, Fox me to get to here, uh, get to you on time. But anyway, now for something a little bit different on product compliance. And Felix has been talking to you about why the New Deal for Consumers is the is the sort of new GDPR. Well, I'm going to talk to you about product compliance, which is going to be the new New Deal for Consumers. So um, we're we're moving on to the the kind of next big thing. So there's quite a lot of um, horizon scanning that uh, is going to be happening here, and just looking ahead at what's coming in at both an EU and a UK level. And this will really affect you if you um, if you put any kind of physical product 
onto the market, uh, either as a brand owner or you've got entities that exist in the UK or Europe this will affect you in terms of the of obligations that are going to apply to you and you're going to need to start thinking about. So why is product law changing? Well, product law is changing really to, to deal with the green and the sort of sustainability issues that go around the consumption of resources for making products. And that's driving legislative reform, both in the EU and the UK. And it, what the European Commission has come out and said is, look, without some sort of policy intervention taking place here, by 2050, the world population will be consuming um, resources at a rate three times higher than the Earth can replenish. So in other words, we'll be utilizing resources as if we had three planet Earths as opposed to planet, just one planet. And at the same time, the amount of waste that we're going to produce is expected to increase by 70% by 2050. So that's clearly not sustainable. And what has happened within Europe is there's a, a plan, and Felix touched a little bit on something called the, the, the Green Deal. Um, that part of that is something called the Circular Economy Action Plan. And what, what that said within Europe is we need to have some kind of sustainability initiative here around products. And what that initiative is going to address is this throwaway culture, as my uh, slide is showing. And then to try and bring together, don't worry, Felix, that's fine. And then try to bring together legislation, which at the moment is very piecemeal, and just to make it far more comprehensive and and sort of collected and it's also really about ensuring that there's far more reliable information about the sustainability of products that's available to people within the supply chain so that there can be far more informed choice not just from consumers but also um, from distributors and retailers to be able to choose products that that are greener and are meeting some of these um, legislative changes so um, what I'm planning to look at are kind of three main um, principles or three main changes that are, that are coming in. Uh, looking at eco-design, looking at the right to repair, and looking at something called extended producer responsibility. So let's just um, start with eco-design, please, Felix. So eco-design, let's start with the position in the EU. Now we already at the moment have an eco design directive. So if you have, if you're somebody that is involved in any way in electronic products, then you'll already be familiar with, with eco design. But what we have got at the moment is a, is a consultation to really extend out um, eco design into further products. And what the proposal is saying at the moment is that eco design is actually going to apply to any product any product, physical product, that's put onto the market or put into service. And I've just put there on the slide, there's a consultation out at the moment, which is going to be closing on the 9th of June. And what we know from this consultation, which includes as a draft regulation um, that uh, exists as well, so you can, you can see what is being proposed, are the kind of these various principles I'm just going to run through. Now, what I should flag is that in, this is a, a a proposal at the moment okay so what we'll what we'll see is this will go through a legislative process and there will be some amendments made as it goes through the, the European Parliament and, and the Commission process but first off there's a, 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 a position around setting standards for durability reusability and upgradability and what that means is they are categorizing products and for each of those categories, they're actually setting out technical standards that the product will need to be designed to meet to achieve durability, reusability and upgradability. So you'll have to look for how your pro or which kind of standard, which category your product falls within. And you'll need to start meeting that standard and designing this, the products to meet that criteria. There's also a big um, point in there about information and this concept of something called a product passport. 
And the idea behind a product passport is that every product will have this, this product passport that will be both digital and physical, and it will contain information about how the product meets those eco design requirements. So those standards that I was just talking about, and also some more general information about the product in, in, in relation to, to things like traceability um, and, and any other kind of mandatory information that, that might be needed. So this product passport, I could well see becoming quite um, quite a detailed document uh, and quite a detailed piece of information that will accompany each each product. And the idea is also that each product will have a unique identification number, so you'll match your product passport with the unique identification number on the product. Moving on then to that point about uniform and comparable labeling. So the idea here is, and this is probably every marketeer will be hating this, but the idea that you're going to provide some consistency across the labeling of products so that it makes it easy for people to be able to compare things like energy use, for example, for products comparing one against the other. And that information is not only going to have to go onto the, onto the product packaging, but would also be displayed online as well. There's also a push there to try and um, disincentivize people from destroying unsold consumer products. And the way they're purporting to do that is to, to place an information requirement on companies. So you'll actually have to publish data each year explaining um, the quantity of product that you've, uh, that you've had to disclose and what, uh, sorry, to destroy and why it is that you've had to destroy it. So they're really trying to reduce the number of unsold consumer products that are simply uh, put into to landfill. Now, these proposed obligations will apply to all economic operators uh, in the supply chain, including online marketplaces, which has been um, quite controversial, but is very much uh, the mood music to, to bring obligations um, onto online marketplaces as well. But your obligation will be commensurate with your role. So as a manufacturer, clearly, you're going to have a much bigger responsibility in terms of design than, than somebody further down the chain. But even if you're a distributor, there'll still be obligations on you to actually verify that the products that you're selling meet some of these criteria. So there's still a verification obligation, even if, they're, if you're not primarily responsible for, for the design. So that's what's happening from an eco um, design perspective. Let's just move to the position in the UK, Felix, with the, with the next slide. Now, we do already have uh, an eco design regulation that came in and actually started applying to products from the 1st of July um, of last year. But this is limited to certain white goods predominantly. And like you can see there on the slides, I've listed them out. Uh, it's very similar to some of the proposals that are being talked about in Europe, but the UK's eco design regulations also include this concept of a right to repair, which I will come and talk on a little bit more on uh, in relation to the EU. So the idea of the right to repair there is that you, you have to incorporate into your design the ability to repair the product as opposed to simply throwing it away. And you also have to make spare parts available and you have to actually make these spare parts available for a minimum of seven to 10 years after the last model of whatever your product is has gone onto the market. And also the ability for people to make repairs has to be easy. So the, the legislation says you, it has to be a repair that a professional repairer could, could, could make with some commonly available tools is, is the phrase. So just making it much easier for people to get these products fixed. I flagged up there as well, just specifically for energy related products that there is some further consultation taking place there. So this will extend out some, st some of those standards I was, um, talking about at the moment I've said there's white goods but there's also some further products that are going to be uh, incorporated into this concept of eco design so things like lighting products um, commercial refrigerators servers and other things are coming into that so it's just a flag in case that is part of your world so eco design so the kind of key point to get from that is look if you're putting if you're doing physical products it's all now about making products that are going to last and really thinking about that in how you're you're manufacturing and designing your products so let's just move to the right to repair um please felix which is the next one so i explained there that for the uk the right to repair is incorporated within that eco design um regulation but the European Commission has also outlined plans to establish this right to repair. 
and this will be produced in separate legislation so UK we've combined the legislation EU are keeping eco design and right to repair separate at, um, at the moment and there was a consultation that um, closed at the beginning of this month and we're expecting some draft legislation to arrive around the third quarter of this year and so what what, do, what are we flagging here well really there is already if you if you're a consumer in the eu and you've got a faulty product then you already have um a right to um to not necessarily to have a right to repair but a right to to get some kind of reparation if you like from the manufacturer if there's was a defect in the product at the time of delivery and it becomes apparent within the legal warranty period what is being proposed now is that this right of repair is going to apply more broadly and actually they're looking at it applying whenever there's just simply been some wear and tear to the product so if there's been wear and tear or it's been mishandled within a, a certain defined period of time then actually there is going to be a right for the consumer to say well i want to have my product repaired rather than have it simply replaced for example or to have compensation now, we don't know which categories of products this is going to apply to. It may apply to all. It may only apply to certain categories. At the moment, what the EU is saying is that certainly consumer products and electronics are likely to be amongst these, but we don't know the full extent of this um, at the moment. I mentioned there that, that, that consumers have, um, have this sort of right, have a right to repair, but one of the shifts here is to really make this the primary remedy available to consumers. So this would be the first thing that actually as a, as a manufacturer or a retailer that you should be offering to consumers. And you're only really offering a replacement of the product if a repair is really not possible and it's going to be much more costly than replacement. So that's where the emphasis comes here. They're also looking at um, the legal warranty period, which uh, in, in Europe, is, um, is, is two years. And so there's a question of whether or not once you've had your product repaired, will the warranty start again, for example? Will it, will it apply to the whole product or will it only apply to the piece that's been repaired? Um, that's, that's still to be agreed. Um, and possibly also extending the legal warranty period for secondhand or refurbished products. Because I think what we'll see now is that as more and more goods are repaired, that, that secondhand market um, is really going to, to grow. And so I think you'll, you'll see a lot more regulation around that as well. So that um, is a little bit about right to repair in the EU. Just a word on the UK, because I explained how that was coming in as part that, that exists within the eco design regulations. But what we've seen very recently is, is confirmation, certainly from um, one of the main regulators here, the Competition and Markets Authority, that they really feel this right to repair should be broadened out to, to a wider category of products than just those um, electrical and white goods that I talked about. So a real push again to push right to repair out to, to all products. So hopefully you're getting up that real sense of mood music of if if you've got physical products this is this is where we're going next point i just wanted to touch on which is on extended producer responsibility and look at this uh, specifically in the uk who are a little bit further ahead um, than europe on this point but something similar is is looking likely to be coming in within within europe as well now with this i'm moving on to, to packaging so this really is going to apply to you again if you're a business if you're a brand owner and you put product out onto the UK market if you have any UK entities that import your products uh, into the UK this will also apply to them and what it's what it's doing is putting an obligation onto you to start paying for the full cost of the packaging that not only surrounds the product but also you may you may use when you're shipping the product from the states uh, into the UK so any pallets or uh, shrink wrap or cardboard for example that may go around it now we have something at the moment which is called producer responsibility but this is now extended producer responsibility because it's at the moment you only pay for something like that 10 percent of the the kind of life cycle of the packaging but what extended producer responsibility is going to do is to put an obligation 
on you, on the brand owner, on the importer, to pay for the a hundred for the hundred percent of the life cycle of the packaging. So when the when it's coming into the UK, um, as it's going through the 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 distribution and retail chain as it's going to the consumer, as the consumer is then putting it out as part of their recycling obligations, you, you are paying into a scheme that then pays for the recycling of all of that packaging. So it's really quite a, a big shift um, and obviously a big shift to try and encourage um, people who are using packaging to imp sort of improve the quality of the packaging. So you're making your packaging much easier to recycle or even better reducing the amount of packaging. So you're, you're basically paying less. Now, this was expected to be coming in in 2024, uh, 2023. It's now being delayed until 2024. But what that will mean is that they, the, the authorities will start collecting data from businesses that qualify during 2023. And I've put those thresholds on there. So if you're a business where you've got a turnover of over two million pounds and 50 tons of packaging per annum, then you are a business that needs to register. I really flag this because I remember when the producer responsibility regulations first came in and I had a plethora of US clients who were not aware of those regulations and the regulator in the UK is really hot on this and uh, a number of clients got quite heavily uh, prosecuted and fined in relation to this. So um, it, if you think this could apply to you, if you think you're going to be anywhere near those qualifications, uh, those thresholds, then this is really something that you need to be looking at. There is, you can see another threshold there. Now that is not, you don't, you, it's a threshold to report. So you have to report data. This is not about um, actually um, paying the money for the fees. This is just monitoring the amount of, of packaging that's coming in. So um, that's a, another flag there, that's a new requirement. So registration um, is with the scheme administrator. This is a new regulator that's being set up in the UK. They're going to be um, created during the course of next year. And I've put on there again, controversially, it's going controversially, it's going to apply to online marketplaces. So if you sell your goods via Amazon, for example, then um, Amazon is going to be obligated in terms of paying these packaging and recycling costs. So, you know, they're going to be coming back out to you to, to get uh, your share of that. Modulated fees is just a flag. The, the, the amount you pay will depend on how complicated your recycling is. So the more, more, more stuff you have, more packaging you have, the more you pay, the more complicated your, your packaging is. So if you use lots of different types of plastic polymers or you use black plastic, for example, you're going to be paying a lot more than somebody that's just simply producing something that's very simple and easy to recycle. And just a note there that there's going to be a, a mandatory labeling requirement for all products, all packaging. So ignore those thresholds. So any product that's coming into the UK from 2026 will have a new little symbol it needs to put on, which just simply says you can recycle or you can't recycle. So some quite big changes coming in there and potentially some um, expensive changes as well if you if you get it wrong and you don't you don't register. Felix, just a quick word then. It comes no surprise, as I said, that Europe is, is doing um, something very similar. It, they're a little bit further behind, but it's exactly the same principle. So under European Green Deal and the Circular Economy Action Plan that I mentioned at the beginning, they're really, again, looking to try and reduce the amount of, of, of packaging and the aim there to make all packaging reusable or recyclable by 2030. So we're expecting a very similar set of regulations coming out uh, in July of this year, which will be saying something similar. So... UK and EU, you really, you know, need to start if you're if you're in this world, if you're in a products world, start thinking about how you're going to be um, designing your products to make them last longer. Think about your packaging so that it is it you're either reducing it as as far down as you can or making it as simple as you possibly can. Otherwise, I think you're going to find that it's it's going to be quite expensive. So that was my whistle through. Felix on product compliance in EU and UK and I think you're finishing off. Yes I am so I promised um, some some more Germany specifics and there's going to be a little bit of UK and France thrown into this as well um, so as you as you can see I mean there's there's been a little bit for everyone we we've had smart products we've had physical products of any stripe we've had digital content um, now I'm going to talk a little bit about something called the German Fair Consumer Contracts Act um, 
which specifically applies to subscriptions. But they could be subscriptions for like ongoing delivery of, of things like you can subscribe now to a monthly delivery of socks, right? Or, or, or laundry detergent or whatever it is, or it can be a subscription for, um, for, for a digital service, for a streaming service, for participation in, in some kind of club or anything, anything like that. It's really anything that is a, a contract that is not a one-off, but kind of goes on. There are two torture instruments that Germany is, is implementing here. Somebody said in, in the chat, oh, it feels like this is a, a victim of bullying standing up to the bully. Um, I, I'd like to think that what I'm now telling you is more like bullying back because this is really going to be very complicated. So on any website, and it's not entirely clear whether that includes digital apps or dedicated apps, but probably it does. Also not clear whether it includes voice assistance, but it, it's gonna be, it would be hard to implement, so maybe not, but we don't know. Definitely any website where anyone can enter into a contract for a subscription, um, you have to incorporate an electronic cancellation form that is supposed to make it as easy to cancel a contract as it is to enter into it. Um, there are some very, very specific formal requirements of what that um, cancellation form needs to look like. So it, it needs to have a certain number of fields that are described in, in the act, uh, basically for people to put in their name and other identifying information um, about the contract that they want to get rid of. So something like a contract number, or member number, or something like that. Uh, their contact information, um, the reason why they want to terminate, whether it's for cause because something's broken or just for convenience because they just want to terminate whenever the next convenience termination is, is possible. And then that's, that's basically that form. You can't make it harder for people to terminate by asking them 16 more questions that are all mandatory answers. You can, importantly, you can't force them to log in or to go into a user account to actually access this. It has to be just like your privacy policy and your mandatory contact information, all that stuff that you usually see in the footer of the website, that's where this needs to go. And then at the end of that, it needs to have a button that says, terminate now. If you don't implement that exactly in the way that the legislator would like you to, you're in breach of consumer law, but because this only applies in Germany, you, you can't have a free member state infringement. So you, you're not looking at those 4% fines most likely. Um, but you are looking at um, non-compliance and, and there can be smaller fines in, in Germany and consumer groups can send you a cease and desist. But also, and this is a more painful one, and I realize I shouldn't have put that on the slide because you all know what's coming now. If you don't implement that, then consumers can terminate at any time. So even if you thought you locked them into a one year subscription, if you don't have this implemented the right way, they can come after half a year and say, I'm gone, I'm out, I don't want this anymore. And they can claim a refund of half their money, right? So cancellation button, that applies to any website, everything as of the 1st of June. So if you're selling anything in Europe, any subscriptions, and you haven't thought about that cancellation button, now would be a very good time uh, to talk to your engineers and possibly reach out to me after that and I can I have some more detailed materials on what that button needs to look like. That's the one thing. The other thing that's also scary is that we now have limits on auto renewal clauses. So like here, um, it was always standard practice to have a one year auto renewing subscription to things. So you sign up for a year and after after that year, unless you say I don't want it anymore in time, that renews for the next year and the next year and the next year. Of course, the consequence of that is if you miss the deadline, then you're stuck for another year with a contract that maybe you don't need anymore, you, a service you're not using anymore or whatever. To limit that risk for consumers, there is a new law that now that applies for all contracts that are newly formed on or after the 1st of March. It doesn't touch contracts that you had before. So if I signed up for a one-year auto-renewing subscription on the 1st of January, um, it will auto-renew 
until someone terminates it for fixed one year periods that will still stay in place. But if I sign up for it now, I can still sign up for up to two years as an initial term. That's the maximum that's permitted. Market standard is to not do two years other than for cell phones where you actually basically give people the phone. Everything else is generally a one year subscription. But then um, auto renewal is only valid if it is for an indefinite amount of time with a maximum one month notice period. It's not technically exactly the same thing as month to month, but it's almost the same thing. So it means that after the first year, everything just continues, but the consumer can get out of the, uh, out of the contract with a maximum of a one month notice period. You can go shorter if you want, um, but you can't go longer than that. So nobody is gonna be stuck in a contract after the initial term for longer than a month ever. That, and again, all of this is only in B2C, so only um, businesses transacting with consumers, and it's only for paid agreements. But as we have learned, paid also means giving people data. If your terms do not reflect this mechanism, then what that means is the actual automatic renewal doesn't take place because the clause that operates the automatic renewal is unenforceable, which would then mean that after a certain amount of time, a consumer could come back and say, hey, actually, this contract never actually renewed, so I want my money back. Um, if someone has been a power user of your service and then says they want their money back, maybe there's an unjust enrichment argument to be made. Maybe. I wouldn't, I wouldn't bet the company on it. But certainly, for someone that is a more or less a dormant user. They signed up for something, they keep paying 15 euros for it every year. It comes out of their credit card, they don't even, or their bank account, they don't even notice, but they haven't used the service in forever. Um, of course, they could come back at some point and say, for the last three years, this has been auto renewing, but in fact, um, it's not that that wasn't valid, so I want that money back. And of course, if one person does that and talks about it on the internet, you're going to get a lot of other dormant users that are going to want their money back. So this is another probably important one to implement. Um, so these two last things that I was talking about, this is Germany only for the time being. But in terms of these auto renewal mechanisms, um, there are some similar concepts in other European jurisdictions. So in France, for example, you are obliged to inform people before their contracts auto renew in time so that they have time to say, oh no, actually, no, I don't need it anymore. And you have to actually have in your terms and conditions, you have to copy paste a bunch of articles from their consumer code that explain this mechanism. That's also always a bit of a challenge if you're trying to do a set of terms and conditions that applies everywhere in Europe. Um, it, it's never technically possible to have one set that is equally compliant everywhere um, because in France you have you have this obligation. So you, you're always going to end up with a France addendum somewhere in there, and then you're going to end up with the Germany addendum somewhere else and with other addenda. Um, so just to keep that in mind, if that's what you're, if that's what you're going for, there's, there's a little bit of a trade-off there always. In the UK, um, there is not specific legislation that creates these specific requirements for how long the term can be and so on, but the CMA, um, about which Katie has also spoken uh, just before, they've issued guidance. And it's weirdly specific because I think it talks about only um, auto renewal of antivirus software. But the principles that they put in this guidance are basically just interpretation of the general unfair commercial practices law, which says you cannot mislead consumers. And how they interpret that is obviously not limited. There's nothing in there that is so specific to antivirus software that I would say, well, it can't apply to anything else. And so similar to the French uh, provision, basically, you can't mislead people about whether it's an auto renewing subscription. If they turn it off, you can't sneakily turn it back on. Um, you have to inform people that they can turn it off and so on and so on. Um, the, the one thing that shocked me most when I saw that was that they are basically saying you have to interact with dormant consumers and you have to point out to them that, hey, you've been paying for the service, but you haven't ever been using it. Do you really still want it? Again, that's not a clear and defined law. That's their interpretation of what a fair business dealing would look like. I would expect that there is, there, 
this is currently in a kind of draft and consultation stage, this guidance, so it's, it's not even technically fully applicable yet. Uh, but if and when they try to enforce that, I would expect there to be litigation about that point because I, I think that is really, someone said draconian in the chat and I, I really agree with that. Um, so, but uh, keep that in mind. So there is a push in, in Europe, including the UK for this purpose to kind of protect people against getting stuck in subscriptions that they may no longer want or no longer actually use. So what does all that mean? There is one thing that I want to really drive home here about, I mean, if you forget all of those other details that we talked about, there's, there's one thing that's really important to keep in mind if you have any kind of responsibility in your organization for managing these kinds of things. Compliance with European consumer regulation and generally European regulation is never ever a matter of putting the right language in your terms and conditions. That's one part of it, but it's that, that is never all. It, it never works like, oh, we just have to use the right magic wording. It's, there are mandatory disclosures and some of them you have a very clear and rigid corset of language that you have to use. And if you don't, you do it at your own risk and, and you will get censored. Um, but it's one of those cons. You also need to make sure someone was, we were talking in the chat um, uh, briefly about um, claims that you make in your advertising versus what's actually in the terms. Well, guess what? If your advertising promises more than what your contract says, you're still stuck with what your advertising said. Um, Obviously, when you think about things like having a cancellation button, not only do you have to put that on your website, so somebody needs to put that in the sales UI, but also it needs to do things on the back end. So it, you, there needs to be a confirmation email, and then you actually need to let that customer out of their contract, right? So the back end process must be in there. And of course, your product itself must reflect certain things like must be repairable, must you must be able to maybe take it apart to access certain things in the, in the inside of the product. And your privacy practices must of course comply with what, it, what you're saying in the privacy policy, but also your privacy policy must say what your practices actually are and those must be legal. So um, all of these things kind of all are, are intertwined, meaning it's really important to get all these different stakeholders on board if you're working on these compliance projects, um, get them all on board early and make sure everyone's on the same page and they know what it is and understand what it is that they have to do. Before we go to Q&A, I just want to thank Katie and Felix for delivering an awesome presentation. I mean, I hope, I personally hope all these, all these measures stay in the EU. Don't come to, don't come to America. So it's really interesting to hear. I, I like to visit the EU, but you know, I'm not going to move there. But anyways, or maybe I should, because uh, there's a lot of great protections for consumers. So a couple of things, the, uh, the email to get the slides is info, as in I-N-F-O at in-house connect. Org. And if you thought that the program was great, please let us know in the chat. Let uh, Katie and Felix see the applause. I'm getting some, some questions. So yeah, no, no UK CLE credit for this, unfortunately, only US. You're obviously welcome to apply in your jurisdiction. That's totally up to you. But we have a list of states that we are pending CLE for, and, and that's where we apply. Um, and any you know reciprocal credit that you want to apply for is, is totally up to you, obviously. So any questions, you can email info at inhouseconnect.org or CLE at inhouseconnect.org. Okay, we have a bunch of really great questions. A bunch of them you you uh, you both were answering in the chat. So so how about this? Can we do a quick recap? This is only B two C. It only applies to subscription digital subscription services, right? Um, and if we can expand on that, um, and it includes advertising, we could just do a quick you know three minute or two minute soundbite to to encapsulate. That that. Yeah, absolutely. So I've been I've been looking at at some of these uh, questions that have been coming in. So there's one that I think came came a few times where people were asking about Switzerland. So um, yes, Switzerland frequently does follow the EU in many of the things. Although I will say that last year uh, there was supposed to be a more institutionalized framework agreement between the EU and Switzerland that then Switzerland walked away from those negotiations. So currently. Um, we're not expecting them to maybe be as closely aligned to the EU on, on many of these things. I certainly am not aware of anything equivalent to the New Deal for Consumers happening in Switzerland. 
Um, if I ever come across something like that, I will be sure to talk about it on LinkedIn. So some of you will connect with me. Um, we'll, do, we'll do another update on how this all shaped out next year. Um, and if, if Switzerland um, starts doing similar things and makes similar noises, um, certainly we'll, we'll, uh, we'll tell you about it. Um, the other question- or the Felix, well, I would just add to that yeah. though, I think, because quite often people sort of just assume that Switzerland will be the same. And I'd really encourage you to get separate Swiss advice if you, if you do put product out or you do do business in Switzerland, because often it's similar, but it's not the same. And I know the regulators there do tend to get a little bit, um, I was about to say angsty. I don't know if that's the word that gets used in the US. They get a bit um, irate when um, actually businesses just treat them as if they are within the EU. So if you do do business there, I would just get some separate Swiss advice. Yeah, absolutely. So then there was a question about, um, uh, yeah, kind of the scope of application of all of this. I just want to clarify again. So the new deal for consumers um, is for contracts between a professional provider and a consumer. And a consumer under EU law, and I think this bit of it is still the same in the UK um, because that has been the definition in the EU forever, is um, a person, an individual. So in, as if it's not an individual, it's not a consumer. You can already like even nonprofits or associations, I think can kick that out. But an individual entering into a contract that's not predominantly for their um, professional or, or commercial purpose, uh, that's a consumer. Um, so if I go out and buy stuff for myself in in Germany, I don't read any terms and conditions because they're either fair or unenforceable. Um, I sometimes read them out of professional curiosity. But um, if I were to buy something for the law firm, so if I were, even if I buy another screen to put in my home office, I would not be a consumer at that point. There is some case law uh, in Germany where a lawyer had, had some lamps or something or light fixtures delivered to her office, probably because she wasn't home during the day and she wanted those packages to arrive at her office. And then she wanted to withdraw from that contract saying, well, I'm a consumer. And because it was, it had the name of her firm on, on, on the package and in her, in her order form, uh, the, the seller refused and said, no, this is, I sold these to a law firm. Um, what do you want? Right. And so she was not able to withdraw from the contract. So if you kind of, pretend like you're not a consumer, you're also not covered. But it doesn't necessarily work the other way around. So if you have a disclaimer somewhere on your website that says, I only sell to non-consumers, you do actually have to back that up with verifications, like actually you know, have people send you a copy of their business license or company registration or something. Because if you just put that language somewhere, again, as I was saying, in the, in, in the EU, we don't other than in Hogwarts, we don't believe in magic spells. So you actually have to do it. It's not sufficient to just have a disclaimer somewhere. Um, so that was the, the consumer definition bit. And then I'm just scrolling through the chat. What else is happening here? There were some products, uh, some questions, Katie, I think for you about classes of products that are covered. I have a quick question, actually. So I'm, I'm very new to EU things. So I have a simple, I have a, like a basic question. Who exactly enforces this? And is there like a cure period at all? Like, is there a warning shot? Is there a, you know, anything like that? So who enforces it? Um, there's, there's two ways of enforcing it. Um, one is a little bit specific to, to Germany and then one is pan-European. In Germany, you have a very active network of consumer watchdog groups. They're nonprofits. Um, they get a lot of political backing and some state funding as well. Um, so they're, they're really, institutions, and they can come and send you a cease and desist letter and say, hey, your terms are unenforceable or your practice here, we did a, a test purchase and your practice is not up, up to snuff. Um, and then you have to sign a cease and desist. And then you actually have to change whatever it was that, that, that they were flagging, because then if you don't, you have to pay a contractual penalty to them. Uh, that first warning shot is cheap. It costs a couple hundred euros in fees to them. Um, and then obviously you have a very short time to, do, to make those changes. If you refuse, then they can get that contractual penalty. Or if you refuse to even sign the cease and desist, they can take you to court. They can really quickly get an injunction within sometimes a week or two. Um, and if you violate, if, you're, if you don't follow that injunction, you're in contempt and that's a $250,000 uh, uh, euro fine. That's kind of the way it has been historically happening. Um, now with the new rules, there's going to be, and that was the same in other uh, EU member states, there's going to be 
public authorities that are going to then come after you and tell you to change it and fine you. So again, a lot of this is modeled on kind of the mechanism that uh, we've seen with the GDPR. What's happened under the GDPR was indeed that authorities would reach out and in the beginning also try to educate and try to you know, slap your wrist, give you a small fine or not give you a fine at all, but basically say, hey, you got to change this within a short deadline. Um, th we expect to see some of that maybe in the beginning, but kind of the bigger you are as a company and the more egregious the violation and kind of as we move into next year, we are going to start seeing those fines. So there's not a, there's not necessarily a cure period. It's It's more like if you cooperate with the with the authority, um, they might give you a, a smaller fine, right? So those 4%, that's obviously not an automatic every time it's 4%. That's kind of the maximum where they can go. Um, we haven't seen a 4% fine under GDPR yet anywhere. Um, we've seen some multi-million uh, euro fines for companies like Google, where multi-millions is still far from 4% of what their annual revenue is. So um, it's um, we, we don't expect them to hit you super hard on day one, but uh, there will be some enforcement there. Got it. Thank you. And and Katie, we'll we'll turn to your uh, your questions. I know there's a bunch of back and forth. If you want to just take it from here. Yeah, sure. I, I can tell you some other questions. A, a few of them, like how precise do these disclosures yeah, of destroyed products have to be? Are any classes of products excluded? You know, yeah, and the then a bit specific about EPR from Diana, I think, as well. So, I mean, the, the destroyed products piece um, for, for eco design, I mean, we we don't know how precise it's got to be, but it would be un, it would be unusual under um, both EU and UK law that it's ever is got to be exact to the, you know, to the one or two widgets, as you rightly say, Chris. But there'll probably be a degree of tolerance. But clearly, if there's any sense that you've misrepresented or not given accurate information, then they will... Um, then they would they would enforce against that basically. Um, you know the whole point here is to try and reduce the amount of of goods that are being that are unsold goods that are being destroyed. So they will come down quite hard on that. But I don't think it's down to the the kind of the last widget. But we don't know. Uh, there's still still to be to be decided. But there's quite a lot of information at the moment they're asking you to to provide. So actually that's quite a lot of data for you as a business to collect and to be able to provide up. Um, in terms of classes of products that are excluded at the moment, yeah, you know, as I was saying, this is that both in the EU and the UK, they're thinking big, you know, they're thinking, how is this going to apply to all products? Now, clearly, the more complicated your product is, then um, the more likely you're going to get uh, obligations. So, you know, we already have some obligations in there for white goods and for, for electronics um, and electrical goods. Those obligations around things like design and repairability are going to be much greater than perhaps if you just sell, I don't know, clothes, for example. Um, but that doesn't mean there won't be any obligations. And I, I think, you know, that's that's the important thing to recognize here to get businesses to start really thinking about that. But it might be that certain things get excluded. And I just put in the chat there that um, some some um, products like food and medicines and medical devices, cosmetics is probably another one where we have already some very defined regulatory regimes for those things. You'll find that they won't be included in this. They'll be captured in their own set of regulations. So the principle will still apply. It just won't be under um, things like eco design, etc. cetera. Um, and then Diana's kind of questions about just sort of explaining, I just put a little bit more there in the chat to explain about how it's practically going to work so if you you're going to have to report uh, this is on epr now sorry on extended producer responsibility so you're going to have to collect data that you report every six months on six categories of different types of of packaging so glass plastics aluminium wood paper i can't think what all six are but on six different categories so you report um, the amount of packaging from the preceding six months and then you have to you have to purchase something called prn packaging recovery notes equivalent to the amount of packaging that's being put onto onto the uk market Th that's quite something similar to that already exists um, it's now just being run by a different administrator but in addition to that you're now also having to pay for the end of the the product so when our local councils are going around and collecting um, household waste, so consumer waste recycling that's going out, you now have to pay a share of that as well. 
um, and that's calculated in total to be at about 1.8 billion UK pounds um, per year. So you get a sense of the scale of, in UK terms, that's a lot of money. So um, maybe not to Elon Musk, but there, but there we are. Um, but you know that is so. Instead of the taxpayer paying for for those services, now businesses are going to be paying councils for those services, but through a scheme administrator. And that also includes things that go into um, litter bins, so into trash cans on the street. Um, and there are some separate provisions in there as well for coffee cups. So if there's anybody on here that's in in that um, line of uh, line of business, there's a whole separate thing there about dealing with uh, disposable coffee cups. We just got another question, and, and I guess last call for questions, and then we're going to do a little bit of uh, of networking. Is it the same requirement for products exported from the UK, or, or and I guess in general? On Sandy, do you mean on ex, on extended producer responsibility on EPR? Yes. Um, no. This is all about product that's going. This is on product going on the UK market. So you could be a you can be a brand owner sitting in in the US, but if you put your product out in the UK market, then you're caught by this. Or if you're a US business and actually you've got a a UK entity or a UK importer or distributor, they're going to be caught by this, and you're probably going to therefore have to pay for part of it. But this is all about stuff going on in the UK, not stuff coming from the UK out. If that makes sense. All right. But say say if it doesn't, Sandy. All right. Awesome. Okay. Any, if there's any other, it looks like there's no other questions. So I just want to thank everybody for attending.